What we actually think that we can do with this gene therapy now is correct the epilepsy as well as the other associated Dravet comorbidities. Fellow Homo sapiens, this week on Epilepsy Sparks Insights, we shall be talking to Moran Rubinstein from Tel Aviv University in Israel and Eric Kramer from Université de Montpellier in France, who are both working together on an exciting project into gene therapy for Dravet syndrome, which is a rare genetic epilepsy. They will be talking about their research, its exciting outcomes, and the potential positive impact this could have on treatments for people with Dravet. Hi, Moran Rubinstein, I'm from Tel Aviv University. I've been working on Dravet since 2010, first as a postdoc, and then when I came back to start my own lab. Uh, we've been working on Dravet different aspects. First of all, understanding the molecular, the neuronal basis of the disease, and recently, since uh, 2017, also together with Eric Kramer, who introduced himself in a second, and Ruben Hernandez uh, for, towards gene therapy for Dravet, which will be the main issue of our discussion today, I guess. Very exciting. And Eric, please tell us a bit about yourself as well. Hello, Tori. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Kramer. Uh, I'm a director of research at the French uh, National Health Institute uh, called INSERM. I've been directing a, a basic research lab for about 25 years uh, at the Institute of Molecular Genetics in Montpellier, France. Uh, we became uh, involved in Dravet uh, syndrome in approximately 2014 after we were contacted by a colleague in Spain and she asked us if we would be interested in working with her on this project. We had previously been involved in developing therapies for other uh, rare orphan brain diseases also. So it was a natural uh, jump to go from those diseases to a uh, dry base syndrome. Moran, could you tell us about your research into gene therapy for, for dry base syndrome? So it all started with a European call uh, combining three different countries in Europe to apply for this grant about rare diseases. And this is where uh, I started looking for, for partners and I teamed up with Eric Kramer from France and Ruben Hernandez from Spain and we put together a proposal to try and cure Dravet and the proposal was straightforward. The main reason for Dravet is loss of function in the SN1A gene and we wanted to put the full length SN1A gene into the brain of mice and see whether it can correct the epilepsy and also additional comorbidities that we see in Dravet. So what we decided is to actually test two different viral vector platforms in parallel to see what, which one will give us the best results. One platform is the platform from Eric's lab and the other platform is a platform from Ruben Hernandez in, in Spain. And we tested these two platforms side by side. And once we got the initial results, we knew which one would be a little bit better and move forward with this one. How long did it actually take for you to do these tests on the mice? You, you know, and whereabouts are you now in the process? So we started 2017. I think it took us about a year and a half, maybe two years to test these two initial platforms in the mice, see that they work and ameliorate the epilepsy in Dravet, but one of them was a little bit better, and this is what we move forward with. So Moran was talking about a viral vector. So essentially, this is taking a virus, removing the, uh, the DNA from the virus, because it's a DNA virus, uh, making the virus inoffensive, and then replacing the stuff that we removed with a cassette and that would be a section of DNA that then would code for the protein that's deficient in uh, uh, Dravet syndrome. So this is the NAV 1.1 protein that we were putting in there. So this is essentially what a viral vector is and then we produce this. So at the beginning of the project, we had a long time about, uh, and a long thorough discussion about what we need to do, where we need to express this protein and which cells in the brain also, and which would be the vector that would preferentially give us the results the most encouraging. So these were the criteria to, uh, of how to move forward with the, uh, the vector that we were, uh, we've chosen in the next step. 
We know uh, over the past couple of years with the um, COVID virus, there have been a lot of people who've been, uh, or a substantial number of people who've been a little bit uh, nervous about even the idea of um, vectors or gene therapy of any kind. Could you just reassure people in just a few words of why gene therapy is exciting rather than dangerous and what, and what you do to ensure that is the case? There's several steps before we get to the, the context of gene therapy. Now, the, the difference between the apprehension with a vaccine, for example, versus a vector that's therapeutic is that vaccines are given to healthy people. By contrast, the vectors that we're making are given to patients that have some type of uh, uh, disease or will develop some type of disease. Uh, the risk and the, the problems that are associated with the vaccines is very, very minor. It happens in less than 0.1% of the individuals that are uh, vaccinated. The amount of people that would be treated with a gene therapy project uh, significantly smaller, but still very high. Uh, and the risks are real. Uh, and the things that we need to do to prove that things are safe before we put them in the brains of children are very important. And we take this very, very seriously. And this is why we're moving so slowly to make sure that any uh, potential danger is addressed far upstream and we know the problems and we can stop the process if indeed there are secondary effects. So uh, this is something that uh, we think about every day, you know, do no harm and make sure that everything is safe. And, uh, and the real problem involved in gene therapy is that once you put the vector in the brain, there's no way to get it back out. So we do everything we possibly can to make sure that it's inoffensive, it's going in the right place, and we understand what it's doing, why it's doing, and the potential side effects and, evident, obviously, the therapeutic effects also. And a lot of people, when it comes to Dravet, they think of solely the seizures. Um, understandably, for many, that can be the priority, um, trying to minimise a person's risk of seizures um, and, of course, sudden unexpected death and epilepsy. When you use vectors, how do you ensure or try and make it so that the impact of the gene therapy is only a positive one upon um, the Dravet symptoms? such as the seizures, rather than on other functions of the individual? What we actually think that we can do with this gene therapy now is correct the epilepsy as well as the other associated Dravet comorbidities. And we have evidence from the mice that we can ameliorate the epilepsy, re reduce the number of seizures, we can rescue the early mortality that we see in the mice, but not only that, we also see improvement in some cognitive aspects when we test the mice. Wow. Starting from the beginning, our strategy was to put in the gene that is defected in Dravet. And since this is the root cause for Dravet, we hope that it will cure the, the whole syndrome, not just the seizures. One of the other issues that uh, Moran does in her lab is that once they have the vectors that are potentially therapeutic and they inject them in the uh, Drave mice or the mice with Drave, she's also injecting in healthy mice and she's looking for any signs of side effects that could be associated with that. These are very important controls because as you know, the, the Drave uh, family of individuals is a, you know, the, the disease phenotype is very wide range. So uh, there's a lot of different severities of the disease. So we have to know in the least severe and the more severe if they're safe. So this is one of the controls that we do routine, routinely. And maybe it's important to note here that we didn't see any adverse side effects in wild type mice in which we injected this virus. So as far as we can tell with the experiment that we did so far, and again, these are mice, not patients, this treatment seems to be safe. And for how long do you, or for what uh, percentage of the mice, their, their lifespan, are you, have you been monitoring them for? Because I'm just thinking, I, I can imagine some families will be like, okay, great, so you would help my child with the Dravet syndrome, or the adult with the Dravet syndrome, um, and they'll be okay for a couple of years. What about later on down the road? So we didn't do such a long-term monitoring. What we did so far, and that's also important to note, we started the treatment when the mice are starting having spontaneous seizures. So at the onset of the disease. And in Dravet, that's not so early on. It's around six months of age, and this is what we're doing in the mice. And then we watch them for two months. 
that in my that adulthood. So it will be sexual maturation about the comparison of 12 years in a child. We didn't go beyond that to check. But we hope that if we get over this critical period when the seizure is starting and Dravet is, uh, the seizure frequency is increasing, the risk of SUDAP is high, if we get over this period of time and we can get the kids to grow and the brain to grow, hopefully additional changes will happen that will stay through the whole life. You have a patient, I understand, for, uh, for what you've discovered in your research. Could you please tell us about that? Basically, the patent process is to uh, protect your intellectual property and uh, patent the idea and essentially the tool. So the, the patent uh, is uh, the tool, the vector, the viral vector that we mentioned before. What we needed to do is that we had to show that it was innovative, that nobody else would have thought of it. What we had to do and what Moran uh, did very well is show that it was efficient and it could work. The idea with the patent now is that this is a beta version uh, of the tool. We can always improve that. Once we understand the disease better, once we inject enough mice, and potentially once we get into patients, we'll see what the vector can and can't do. So we'll be able to patent, uh, we'll continue on with the patent process, we'll add on, we'll increase the efficacy of this vector. So the, the people that are unaware of the patent idea is that it allows you some uh, security once you develop your drug or your vector, is that nobody else can produce a generic version and you can make money off of it. Not the scientists, but the pharmaceutical industry <laughs> will be able to bring this into market because they'll have to invest an enormous amount of money to bring it to the market and then they need the return on their investment also. So this patent protects our idea, protects our tools that allows the pharmaceutical uh, partner to develop it into a true drug and then they'll have some option of selling it uh, down downstream. So uh, the patent is in fact the vector or the drug, the viral vector that we've produced that again is in the beta version it will continue to improve and this is what we'll be doing for the next five years. Gosh, next five years. So over these next five years you anticipate you'll be working with um, pharma companies to develop this further? Definitely, definitely. This is uh, something that we'll obviously be looking for uh, partners to bring this to the next level. As Moran said, we're basic fundamental scientists. We've made the tool. Uh, we know uh, I've been involved in the, the viral vector uh, field for, for a long time, 25 years. Uh, so I know some of the steps. I know how complicated it is. We have to be able to make it in a good manufacturing process. So in a clean facility, we have to test every lot. We have to test it in primates uh, to see if it's safe. Uh, and then we have to test it in initial trials to see if it uh, has an effect on the children. So it's a very long, complicated, tedious process. I, and I think it's really important that we uh, that you mention that because lots of people now hear about a, you know, a potential, or it can be advertised as such potential cure for a disease like Dravet. It's like, oh wow, okay, that's in the market now. We can use that. But no, as you just said, it has to go through a strict, unfortunately long, because you want to have quality process in order to be as safe as possible for patients themselves. And this goes back to your question previously, is how do we know that there's no uh, adverse side effects? You certainly can't put this in the brain uh, of a child and think, okay, in the first six months, if everything is fine, that's great. We have to look long-term. We have to make sure that it's safe for years after. And this is part of the problem also, by injecting that in the brains of uh, monkeys, for example, uh, we'll see uh, the long-term effects as well as the short-term effects, obviously. So these are these are some of the criteria that every day we think about these effects. To learn more about Moran and Eric, make sure that you check them out using the links below where you can find multiple links to their profiles and their work.